is an opportunity to talk to uh, a woman who you know from television uh, as both a, uh, a model of uh, independence and uh, spunk and also an endlessly understanding woman. Uh, and in the brief time I've gotten to chat with Connie backstage, I can tell you that the real person is every bit as uh, worthy and interesting as the one that she plays on TV. Um, so I wanted to ask you, Connie, how did you get interested in, in this? What, I know that you've been in, uh, spent time in, in now uh, uh, Ghana and Rwanda and Sierra Leone and especially Ethiopia where you adopted your son from. Uh, just in sum, what, what drew you to Africa and the specific problems of women in poverty there? Um, well, for me, it started, um, it really started while I was in college. You know, there, there are those moments in life that that you remember so so specifically, and you realize that it, it they become turning points for everything else that follows. I was taking a course, and I think studying the Civil War in Mozambique, and you, you know, I, I came from a small town in Virginia, and suddenly, and really hadn't had a lot of this education, and uh, felt very fortunate to be able to be introduced to things that were happening around the world. And I know it sounds kind of naive, but I remember calling my father on the phone uh, crying and saying, what can we do? What can we do to help that these things are going on around the world? And, um, you know, I look back on it and it seems so naive now, and yet it really shaped everything that I did from there on because I had always loved acting. I, I finally decided that's what I really wanted to try to do, but I always thought that if I could do, I thought if I can do the thing that I love and that I think I have a talent for, I then maybe can parlay it somehow into this broader idea of helping around the world and, and maintain that vision of helping around the world. So that's really where it started and, and, uh, and then it evolved from there. So given your experiences now over a number of years in Africa, especially dealing with with poverty among women and girls. Uh, tell, tell the people here who, as you say, have been busy dealing with the convention and the hustle bustle of minute-by-minute minute politics, summarize for us what the situation is in Africa in terms of health and poverty for women and girls, especially there. What, to, give, us, give us some sense, vivid sense of what the crisis is. Well, I, I'm, I'm imagining that a lot of the people here have a little bit of a sense of, of it, but um, I, I'm, I'm here today and, uh, having, and following a lot of the work that I've done, trying very hard not to look at it as a crisis as much as as a resource. And I think that what is important for us in this election is, and what we can come, one of the things we can come away with today as we go out and we are speaking to these people who we're about to bring into office, is that we have an enormous untapped resource around the world in women and in girls. And, you know, uh, around the world, most of the people who are living in poverty are women and children. And women are also doing a vast majority of the work around the world and have something like 1% of the finances. So right there, there and I've seen in my travels to, to Africa, I went to Rwanda last year, I saw the impact of a, a microfinance loan co-op on a small rural town and the women in that town and how giving those women a little bit of opportunity a little bit of financial stimulation changed them, changed their families, changed their communities. And that is how you do it. And, you know, in, in terms of making it pertinent to the election, we're, we're, and making it pertinent to what's happening here, you know, obviously a lot of what we're dealing with right now is the terror that's going on around the world. And, I strongly believe that if we educate young women, if we give young women opportunity, they will lift up their communities. They will help to defray the poverty that is, that is plaguing people around the world, and that will impact 
all of the people that are going, that are resorting to terror because they have no other option. And I think that that is, you know, military leaders agree with that. I think that that is a very important, uh, and, and I think it's a very important fact. And I think if we look at how threatened the terrorist organizations are around the world by young women getting educated, they must be onto something. They are very threatened by young women getting educated, so threatened that they will do anything to prohibit them from getting that education. So right there, I think that tells us something about what kind of impact educated women around the world could have. I, I think that's very well put. So what you're saying is it, uh rather than using the old-fashioned lens that I used uh, to scare people and being, you know, in, into, into caring. It's about, it's about the positive story of, of development, um, of utilizing human capacity, and about giving a positive answer uh, to fear. Um, but in order for women, or anybody, to be educated, they have to not be hungry. They have to be able to eat. And I'm just curious what you think are the like, key intervention points early on in terms of nutrition and vaccination and other things that give those, uh, those, those kernels of hope, those kids, especially the women and especially the girls. H how do you, from what you've seen, what's the best way to reach them early to allow them to stand as foes of disorder and also as an re economic resource? Well, I really do think it's about empowerment. And, um, you know, we here today are uh, particularly working with one and, and with the UN, you know, we're very focused on policy. Um, and I think that, th to me, that became very interesting because um, when I first visited Ethiopia, I came away and I felt very paralyzed because it just, the, the problem seemed so overwhelming. and. I thought, what can I do, you know? And, and starting a, a school or even an orphanage or even a foundation seemed like an amazing idea, but it also seemed like a drop in the bucket to me. And I started to realize it needs to be about policy. And, it, and, and to me, the policy, it, we really need to focus policy. And this means talking to the people who are here in Philadelphia this week talking to the people who were at the RNC last week and letting them know that this is important to us. This is something we need to pay attention to because if we can empower women in their communities around the world, if we can educate girls so that they can empower themselves in their communities around the world, we will be able to change what the framework of that, what the, what the landscape of that looks like. And that, that's just undeniable. And I think that's, that's, where it, that's where it starts and ends. So in other words, educating women also will allow women in those countries to be advocates for newborns. Right. For, for things like uh, vaccinations and protection against HIV and so on. Exactly, I'm because they can the create points are early on, right? Right, because then they can create. You know, the, they. I mean, look at look at what happened in Sierra Leone. You know, they had the Ebola crisis, and you realize that there's no medical framework there to deal with that situation. The th what I'm saying is, and I'm I'm sort of a broken record, and I'm going back to the same point, is that if we if these women that who are basically not being utilized are allowed to take hold of these these aspects of their own communities, we will have a huge, huge workforce that we are just not tapping into right now. Uh, as you alluded to, it's a kind of tough political atmosphere to some extent, yeah. both in the United States and around the world. There's a lot of people wanting to pull up, uh, pull up the drawbridges to turn inward, to not think about the rest of the world. I think you, get, you made a pretty good case in terms of economic development and in terms of anti-terrorism policy as well. What have you heard or not heard so far at these conventions um, that gives you any, any hope? Well, you know, I, I think we're all <laughs> pretty aware of, of 
there's there are very very strongly different points of view happening right now between the two parties and and the leaders of the two parties and um, you know we do have a, a the the Republicans are adhering to a very wall building uh, perspective um, after hearing the speeches last night here in Philadelphia you know that the speeches were really about unity and um, and compassion and love and um, I found that really reassuring and um, certainly what what we need um, but and I will say one thing to you know the the wall building Donald Trump which is actually Republicans have a great tradition and a great history of doing wonderful work around the world. You know, George W. Bush made huge headway in Africa under while he was president. And there, there is no reason that that shouldn't continue. And I, my, I, just, I just firmly, firmly believe that the, that the wall building mentality and the us and them mentality is not part of the Republican tradition or the American tradition. Yeah, I think you make a really good point, George, the PEPFAR program and so forth. Right. Uh, there is a tradition in the Republican Party, and the Bush family, to some extent, represented it. And um, one could only hope then that, um, that that continues on both sides, that this is not, I don't think Africa should be a partisan issue in any way. Yeah. Because it's, uh, and I cover partisan politics, so I, I know. Um, but the fact is, the situation in Africa as, as Connie uh, has understood it and described it and uh, done a documentary about it and so forth, uh, really should matter to everybody because it is the biggest untapped resource of human intellect and drive and creativity. Uh, it's the place where we began as a species and, uh, and where our fate in certain respects is gonna be decided, I think, and everybody, everybody uh, should understand that. Tell me what happens, uh, I don't know if you've spoken to politicians, if you do that in your line of work with the UN Association, without being specific on names and so forth, what kind of response do you get when you talk to people? Do you get, do you get real concern? Do you get glassy-eyed stares? Do you have, do you, do you, what, what do you get? What's the feedback you're getting from this current environment? on an individual basis when you talk to administrators and government people and politicians? Well, I, I was at a dinner last night and um, was able to talk to several senators, um, all of whom have been very, very uh, extremely active and have been real leaders as far as all of this, all of this fight has gone. But in talking to them, I was really thrilled and pleased to hear that um, they absolutely, you know, they could name, each one of them could name three or four uh, other senators from across the aisle who were just as passionate on this, on this issue as they are. So I really do believe that compassion and humanity are, are, are human, are American values. And um, I, you know, I, I, I don't believe that, that, that that's going to change. Maybe I'm just very idealistic. <laughs> and certainly in this climate, it's tough, it's tough to, to not get a little cynical and not kind of laugh at myself when I say that. But I'm telling you, they're, they're doing it. And we have to, that's why I don't think we should let the cynicism and the frustration and the disappointment to some degree of this election cycle keep us from knowing that this is something that is going to be impactful to all of us and is something that we need to continue to, to fight for. Now, let me ask you a ridiculously leading question. Uh, when he, not only now, but when he leaves office, what can America's quite popular current president do? What should he do? Far be it from either one of us to tell Barack Obama what to do, but we have a, don't we, it strikes me that we have a special uh, the world has a special opportunity here, uh, not to put him in any box. He doesn't belong in any particular box, but certainly if somebody's going to uh, uh, make that part of his portfolio after he leaves office, that, that, that might be a good thing, right? And have you had a chance to talk to anybody in the administration about that? Uh, no, I have not talked to anybody in the administration about that, nor would I ever presume. Go ahead, you're entitled. To, but a girl can dream. Um, 
You know, no, I mean, I think I, I think this president and certainly this first lady are are going to be enormous uh, resources for this country for many, many years to come. And, um, you know, let's not forget where we were eight years ago when Barack Obama came into office and he he was so brilliant at being able to um, put us back into the, the sights of the world in a way that was positive and um, so I, I really do hope that he is going to continue his global, uh, his, his the, the the capacities that he has as a global leader, um, and to, to to really focus in on work like this. And for me, you know, one thing that is very important to me, because I understand, I you know, I also care deeply about domestic policy and domestic issues of poverty. Um, so. It's always very important to me to find the link and find the correlation between what's happening here in our country uh, as far as poverty goes, as far as education goes, and what needs to happen around the world. And I think that Obama is really, really brilliant at being able to do that and to shed light on that. And also to make global, global issues accessible to the American people, and that's what's important. I mean, when I think about myself and how naive I was when I went to college, and the fact that I didn't know about these struggles in Africa to the, deg to the degree that I was learning in that class that day, it makes me realize, you know, we just don't know, we, you know, we, we have a lot to learn, and a lot of times people just need the opportunity to get the information, and I think Obama could be really brilliant at, at continuing that. To go from the uh, to the grand to the uh, to the almost minute, uh, I'm going to do what I can, and everybody in this room should do what they can, in the near term, to make sure that at least one question about what you are passionate about and what we're talking about here today gets asked at one of the presidential debates. Wouldn't that be something? That would be an yeah. accomplishment in and of itself. Yes. Right. So. I promise you that if the one in a hundred chance uh, comes true that I'm, a mod I'm one of the interlocutors, I'll ask it. But I also probably know all the people who are, and uh, so I will. Uh, I, I can't thank Connie Britton enough for taking her time to do something like this, not only this, this little session here, but for, for wanting to represent uh, the United States and the United Nations and indeed the world uh, to try to make it a better place to try to make it more compassionate and understanding, um, like some of the characters that she played. <laughs> so I'll close by saying, uh, uh, clear eyes, full hearts, can't, can't lose. lose. Yes. Thank you so much, Howard. <laughs>